Welcome. Thank you for coming to the Office Hour. My name is Fred Durham. I represent the Friends of the Chautauqua Writer Center. We're a volunteer group that tries to encourage writers and writing on the ground here at Chautauqua, and we hope beyond by both supporting and supplementing the official activities of the institution writer center. Uh, for example, we sponsor the office hour every week at 12.15 on Thursday. Some other weekly activities include open mic, which is for listeners and authors who want to read their work 18 and above. On Tuesdays, right after the Brown Bag Poetry Lecture, Usually in the poetry room upstairs, we offer an informal critique. Uh, if you're a writer and you bring five to ten copies of one page of your prose or poetry, I or some other published writer will lead a critique session of, of your work. So I mentioned author's hour on Thursday. At halftime, I'll tell you about the special event that we sponsor each year. But let's get to the reason you're here, which is not to listen to me, but to listen to our two authors. Our first is Patricia Haberbach, a native Clevelander, is a very former director of the Chautauqua Writers Center from when it started. She is the author of three novels, Painting Bridges, Bottom Dog Press, 2013, Resurrecting Rain, Golden Antelope Press, I that name, 2020, which was nominated for a Pushcart Prize in 2020 as a prize for small presses. And Dreams of Drowning, The Dazzled Ink, 2023, which was a finalist for Santa Clara Somerset Award for Contemporary Fiction and for a Tucson Festival of Books Literary Award. Her poetry cat book, Missing Persons, Wordwood Publishing in 2013, won the London-based Lumen Camden Prize and was cited by the Times of London Literary Supplement in November 2014 as one of the best small collections of the year. She credits the Chautauqua Writer Center for starting and supporting her writing career and remains one of the center's most loyal fans. The Chautauqua Writers Center also is grateful to you for giving it a start. I present Pat Auerbach.
Dana recomputed her finances while finishing off the complimentary breakfast at a table in the motel lobby. Her bill for the night had been higher than she figured, $87, including tax. There was no way her dwindling resources could sustain a dream, dream like that. There had to be something else. She swiped two oranges, a container of yogurt, a cellophane wrapped bagel, and a handful of cutlery from the buffet table and stuffed them in her purse before going back to her room. Gathering up her things, she checked out of the Midtown with its flat screen TV, hot water, and three muffins, and caught a bus downtown to the library. On the seat beside her, the fleece blanket from the motel bed lay neatly folded at the bottom of her bag. Sarasota's Selby Library calmed her the moment she walked through the heavy glass doors into the soaring atrium. A job, any job in this beautiful, light-filled space humming with programs and activities would have been salvation. Unfortunately, the application she mailed weeks ago had bounced back with an impersonal response. Thank you for your interest in the Selby Public Library. Unfortunately, we have no openings at the current time and are not accepting applications. We wish you the best of luck in your search for employment. Of course, there were other libraries. She's been sending applications all over the country. But at the moment, what she needed most was an address. Dina found a copy of Life After Life by Kate Atkinson and nestled into an upholstered chair in a quiet corner. Libraries were so comfortable and felt so safe. They were air-conditioned with clean bathrooms, drinking fountains, tables, and chairs. There was even an electric outlet where she could recharge her phone. Why couldn't she just stay here? There had to be some nook or cranny where she could hide unnoticed overnight. Casually, as though she were just browsing for another book, Gina began searching the building, inch by inch, for a place to hide. There were dozens of places to twirl yourself away at the Alfred Seibel Library, where she used to work, where students were always able to find dark corners for a quick nap or a romantic trip. But this building was nothing but open space and light. Her best hope were the closed doors that might lead to back offices or storage areas. She discreetly tried one knob after another, but all of them were locked. May I help you? Are you looking for something? One of the librarians, a man from the computer lab, was smiling at her, but his smile said, Gotcha, not how can I be of service? Oh, Dina smiled back, flustered and embarrassed, removing her hand from the doorknob. I'm just looking for the ladies' room. Can you tell me where it is? The librarian didn't say a word, but he looked in the direction of the large sign reading restroom. Thank you. I don't know how I missed that. Dina emitted a weak, apologetic laugh and scurried off to hide in the bathroom, where she spent the next hour in a cubicle reading her book with her pants around her ankles. By the time she ventured back into the library, it was after one o'clock and time for lunch. She walked over to Whole Foods where she could eat her pilfered bagel, yogurt, and orange at one of the outdoor tables. She had preferred eating a plate of their curried chicken or sushi with sesame seaweed salad, but she had to make her money last. At least she still had food. What she didn't have was a place to spend the night. Her eyes wandered up and down the street. There were restaurants, boutiques, a parking garage. None of them seemed likely to provide a safe haven. But she began to stroll up and down the street, searching for an alcove where she could safely rest her head. There weren't any. Now she understood why the homeless sheltered in doorways and on the sidewalk in clear view of passers-by. There was nowhere else to go. By late afternoon, Dina was exhausted and terrified that night would find her still wandering the streets. She went back to Whole Foods and bought a cup of coffee that she laced with as much milk and sugar as it could fit into the cup and sat nursing it as she watched more fortunate people. People just like the woman she'd been only a few months ago go 
going about their business. The coffee revived her slightly, but she was hot and sweaty and needed a bathroom. So she headed back to the library with its flushed air conditioning and immaculate facilities. Ignoring two teenagers applying makeup in the bathroom mirror, Venus stripped off her shirt and gave herself a quick sponge bath in the sink, then dried off with paper towels from the dispenser. Refreshed, she walked out of the bathroom and found a comfortable seat with a view of the park. What a luxury to sit in this beautiful building with every creature of comfort close at hand. There had to be a way to book herself into the library for a few nights. She tried phoning Martin, her husband. For the umpteenth time, and for the umpteenth time, she got a message saying that his voicemail was full. Goodbye. Nina clicked off her phone and began a second, even closer inspection of the library. There were upholstered benches in the public areas and beanbag chairs in the children's room that would make wonderful beds, but they were completely exposed. The bookshelves were set with clear sight lines between them. Even the spaces between surface areas were visible from most angles, since the desks were low and situated in the middle of the room. On the other hand, she didn't see surveillance cameras hung from the ceiling. There had to be a way. In the end, the only place that proved both private and secure was a toilet cubicle. The bathroom was clean as public bathrooms go, but it offered nothing but hard surfaces and a cold tile floor. Tina didn't relish spending the night in a bathroom, but it was better than the street. The library was open until 8 o'clock, so she had time to eat dinner and try Martin one more time. She returned to Whole Foods, grateful for their public tables, and began stop stopping through her paperback, I'm sorry, through her backpack for something to eat. She pulled out a can of chili, a box of crackers, and one of the oranges left over for breakfast. She dialed Martin's number as she picked at the chili with her plastic fork. Predictably, he didn't answer. He was probably in Rome dining in Asso, on Asabuco and Risotto alla Milanese in some cozy little trattoria. Damn him. The sun was still bright in the sky when she finished dinner. It was a lovely summer evening. If she were a normal person with a normal life, she'd go to the beach with her husband and watch the sun set. Maybe they'd stop somewhere for a glass of wine and a light supper before going home to bed. When was the last time she and Martin had gone anywhere to watch the sunset? Dina's purse and bag had grown heavier over the course of the day, and her arms were starting to ache from lugging them around. Theoretically, she could have walked over to the bay and watched the sunset by herself, but she was pooped. Instead, she made her way back to the library, planning to spend the night huddled in the ladies' room. Dina read and reread the same two pages of her novel, but couldn't concentrate. The only thing that occupied her mind was whether or not she'd be able to make it through the night without being caught. What was the penalty for hiding in a public building? What was the crime? Trespassing? Breaking and entering? Loitering? Being a public nuisance? Tina had no idea. So far, she hadn't attracted much attention, and she hoped she looked like any ordinary person using the library to read or to do research. At a quarter to eight, a series of bells sounded and a voice over a loudspeaker announced that the library would be closing in 15 minutes. On cue, she stood up, gathered her bags, and casually walked toward the ladies' room. The stall furthest from the door was empty and a bit bigger than the others. She stepped inside and locked the door. None of her bags were visible under the door because she scoped out the hooks where she could hang them out of sight. She turned off the ringer on her phone. More bells sounded, and then the five-minute warning. A toilet flush, a pair of tennis shoes vacated the stall beside her. She could hear water running, a door opening and shutting, and then nothing. Dina crouched with her feet on the toilet seat so that no one checking for stragglers would guess that she was there. The digital display on her phone read 812. Maybe she'd done it, but it was too soon to tell. A minute later, the door banged open and someone else came in, peed, flushed, fiddled with things in a purse and left. Nothing to worry about, she reassured herself. Just an employee making a quick pit stop before going home. It was 820. 
Tina stepped off the toilet but remained alert, listening. At 8.30, she heard footsteps outside in the corridor, but they simply passed by without slowing down or stopping. It was a good thing. No one had come in because the sound of her thumping heart would have given her away. But by the time her phone said 9 o'clock, Tina was starting to breathe easier. In another hour, if no one came, she'd wrap herself in her purloined blanket and try to get some sleep. A minute later, her entire body tensed as new footsteps sounded in the hall. She hopped back onto the toilet seat and held her breath. The outer door banged open and someone walked in and began swinging each of the toilet stall doors open, one after another. Dina could see a pair of men's work suits as someone hit the door to her cubicle, slightly expecting it to open. There was the briefest pause before he hit it again with more force. Is someone in there? The library is closed. You have to leave now. It was a male voice, tired and with a pronounced Spanish accent. He rattled the door, but the lock held. Would he give up and go away if she didn't breathe or make a sound? Please, Mrs., this isn't a hotel. Don't make me take the door off with my screwdriver. I don't like to do this. Dina stepped off the toilet, straightened her clothes, and took her bags off their hooks. Sorry, I'll be out in a minute. He tried to sound normal. An ordinary library page when caught a few minutes past clothing, closing. A moment later, she emerged to find the custodian in blue coat coveralls waiting with a set of keys in his hand. I'll need to let you out. All the doors are locked. Dina followed compliantly, trying to hold her head up trying to reinvent a version of reality where she hadn't been caught hiding in a toilet. The janitor unlocked the door and held it open for her. Good night, Mrs., he said. Maybe you could stay at the Salvation Army. It's at 10th and Central. Buena suerte. Yes, thank you. Good night. Then Dina walked out into the dark. Most of the shops and restaurants were already closed. There were no lights on at Starbucks. Whole Foods had brought its tables and chairs inside. <clears throat> the trees in Five Points Park were lit with myriad twinkle lights that slowly changed color, cycling through the rainbow. But there were no benches where she could sit down to watch them, nowhere to gather her thoughts or figure out what to do next. So she just kept walking. In her wildest nightmare, she'd never envisioned this night. And she had no script for playing it out. Um, I'm going to read just a, a thing that from uh, the third novel that's coming out in November. It's not available yet. So, sorry. Uh, it's called Dreams of Drowning, and it's uh, my Toronto novel. It's set in two different timelines, in 1972 and 1992. Uh, and it has two protagonists, uh, a young American expat who has fled her home in the U.S. to escape a scandal involving the death of her twin sister, and an elderly uh, British-born retired archaeologist. Uh, as the story progresses, there's an element of magical realism that brings the two protagonists and the two timelines together. Um, I'm just going to read you the one paragraph prologue. Um, Help! Joni's shouts are barely audible above the wind and the roar of the outboard motor as she struggles to keep her head above the waves. I put my hands over my ears and close my eyes. But she's still there, still struggling to stay above the water, the panic in her eyes, the mirror of my own, her pale, freckled skin, her green eyes fraught with horror, identical to mine. I watch, helpless, my heart pounding until she disappears, as she always does, beneath the roiling waters of Lake Ontario. <laughs> Uh, 
I was doing this right Fred. now. Fred. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Pat. You uh, really succeeded in putting us in a situation that we hopefully never experience firsthand. I hope you do. And quite a teaser with the with the others that you know as well. Let me just speak briefly about some of the annual events that Friends of the Chicago Writers Center sponsor. Two of them are already in the past this summer. The first week of each season, we have a reception with friends, uh, light refreshments are served here for free uh, on the board. And uh, you get to meet other people and talk with other people who are interested in literary arts, especially the writing end. Um, we're sometimes confused with the CLSC, the CLSC um, focuses on reading. I'll be graduating this year, you know, after reading the required number of, of books. The Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center focus on writing. Now, reception. Just this past Sunday, we had a book fair. Uh, these two people took, took part on Bester Plaza. Um, we do that every year. We also sponsor the favorite poem project that was initiated by Robert Pinsky uh, at the time when he was a poet laureate. Uh, at that event on Monday, July 31st at 5 o'clock in the Hall of Philosophy, selected Chautauquans will get to read their favorite poem and briefly talk about why it means so much to them. The deadline for entering the line to be one of the readers is July 26th. And we also sponsor the annual writing contest, the Literary Arts Contest, for writers of all ages. The deadline is July 30th. Uh, then we have an awards ceremony at uh, 2 30 on Sunday, August 13th. The author's hour and that ceremony and the favorite song project are both streamed on Zoom and then posted on YouTube. You can find out about any of these things as is customary at this day and age. You can go to a webpage, www dot cac.org slash fcwc and you can find out more about that. I also did want to stress with today's live event, both Pat and Sabia will have books for sale and signing at the end. And we might have a few minutes after Sabia's reading for some questions. So keep those in mind. Sabia Rockman is an author, blogger, and speaker on the American Muslim experience. Her memoir, Spreading My Prayer Rug, One Woman's Journey from Pakistani Muslim to American Muslim, was shortlisted for the 2018 William Saroyan International Prize for Writing, won book list and San Francisco Book Festival honors, and was listed among the top memoirs of the Reader's Digest. Excerpts of her memoir were featured in the Wall Street Journal and Salon.com. She has given over 250 talks in nearly 100 cities at houses of worship, academic institutions, and here at the top one. Her op-eds have been published in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, New York Daily News, The Baltimore Sun, and Washington Post. She co-authored her second book with Walter Ruby. We refuse to be enemies. How Muslims can do can make peace, one friendship at a time. Her latest book is titled "It's Not What You Think: An American Woman in Saudi Arabia." You can find out more at her website, www.sabiahrahman.com. That's last name is spelled R E H M A N. I give you a sweet hug. Thank you, Fred, for that introduction. Lots of luck with your new book. It sounds enticing, and you just painted a beautiful and very moving picture of what it's like to be. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today. It's 
anyone ask you to drop what you are doing and move halfway across the world to Saudi Arabia for a few years only, but just go ahead and do that. Would you? I wouldn't, but that's what I did. So it, I was living in New York. I was a hospital administrator. My children had grown up. We had a good life. My husband had a thriving medical practice. And one day he looks up from his medical journal and says to me, there's a hospital in Saudi Arabia that is looking for an oncologist. And my response was, so? <laughs> <laughs> We have actually been exploring the idea of a change in practice in medicine. He said that the practice of medicine had lost its luster, was exploring opportunities, and when this came along, said, let me just write to them and see, you know, what they say. Yeah, so he didn't write to them. So <laughs> he wrote to them, and they said, why don't you come over for a week, for a month, and do a locum tenens? We, uh, you know, what you think of our place, and we'll see if we like you, and uh, let's take it from there. So he said, you know what, maybe I'll do that. And I said, good, let him go and see for himself, and then we know that this is not for us. So he goes. Then he writes back and says, they want to offer you a job as an administrator, and they want you to come over and spend a week over there with them, and they're going to pay for your uh, ticket, so you want to come? Okay. So then I'll have the evidence in my hand that this place is not for us. Mm -hmm. So I take a week off and I go and I change my mind. Now, what is that? It's all in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, you know, two years, you know, what two years? It's an adventure. Let's just go. Before I was leaving, my book club friend Josie said to me, Sabia, when you go over there, why don't you start writing to us every day? You know, like your first impressions can never be rejected. So, and we want to learn with you. And I said, you know, that's a good idea. So as soon as I landed, I started sending emails back home. Day one in Riyadh, this is what happened. And then I'd get all the emails back, oh, really, 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 so what did you do? What did you think? And then day two, and I, and then I got into it, and I realized that I enjoy the writing. And so, the first section of my book is my diary. And when you read it, you will grow with me, learn with me, get confused with me, get exasperated with me, and then, and then it moves on. So we decided to go for two years, find a contract, and end up staying with it. We just loved it there, and you will read my book, you will know why. So the first thing was the abaya. It is a black cloak that you have to wear whenever you are out in public. Well, Lord, if you can get past the idea, the notion that this is being imposed on you, just get past that, it's actually liberating. I no longer have to worry about what to wear. <laughs> I'm in my sweat, go on the abaya and you're ready to go. No worries if it's a bad hair day. Just wrap your head in a scarf, who cares? Except that my husband wasn't trying to be in a shopping mall. <laughs> what was interesting is, you know like over here you have the rural, you have the urban, people in the urban areas are considered progressive, people in the rural areas are considered conservative. In Saudi Arabia, it is the reverse. City versus desert. In the city, I had to wear the abaya in public. In the desert, you could walk around without the abaya, in the mountains, in the rural areas, nobody cared. In the city, women were not allowed to drive. In the desert, lesbian women were driving SUVs. <laughs> In the city, a woman could not work in a public place. A hospital she could work in, but not at a place. In the rural areas, in the mountains of Abha, these women, women owned and operated businesses were flourishing in the most touristy districts with Saudi men reporting to them and they are like, Yalla, go, get the lady ahead. And he's running off to get the lady ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 
then they were contradiction. So in a compound where we were living as experts, as employees of the hospital, when I stepped out of the compound, I had to wear the abaya, but not before crossing the courtyard of the compound where women were lounging in the field. <laughs> and that's fine. Do inside whatever you want to do outside, you have to cover up. And they actually did that to accommodate expect, to make us feel comfortable, to, to let, have us live in an environment where we felt at home. We step out to wear the abaya inside everything. And actually, the Nisti Kabaya is a very stylish woman. Just go to a party, and when the Abayas come off, mini skirts, it's the leather heels, it's sleeveless, it's bronzy neckline, the hairdo is all glistening and shrinking, and my goodness, mm -hmm. I get to like. <laughs> <laughs> then there is the segregation, and here's the contradiction. The houses have two entrances. One for women, one for men. Women go into the women's room, the men go into the men's room. There is a dining room in between with sliding doors. The women will close the door, bring in the food, open the door, close the door. The men come in, take the food, go close, open, you go get the food, you get the bench. Right? Am I going to that? No. Okay. Now you go into a lingerie store on the mall. So I told my husband, I said, you know, I want to go inside Victoria's Secret, but you stay out because that's the name you said. So I go in and there's this table which has all kinds of laundry on it. And I'm picking it up and I'm looking at it. And then I hear a man's voice saying, can I help you? And I turn and look around <laughs> and he's holding a panty and he's taking it from the table. And I dropped that ball and ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and the laundry is Laundry. And then I took in another seat, and you know, there's this man at the counter, and he's selling laundry to the women over there who are buying it off the rack. No problem. Contradictory? Yes. But they have to make do. They have to try and, you know, accommodate everybody. Yes, women need laundry. No women cannot work in a laundry store. <laughs> Pretty confusing. They are trying to balance positions with practicality. No public entertainment, not when I was there. Now, of course, things have changed. I saw more movies, more opera, more performances in the concert than I ever did at the bench. Actually, our hospital had a video store. We would go and get all these videos of the rest. So anyhow, my husband gets a job as an oncologist. I apply for a job, I am hired right away, I go to HR, and that is an experience. All in the book, but bottom line was that when I started filling out my form, and I completed it, he pushes, oh, he is the Saudi woman with a niqab, pushing the papers towards me and saying, can you have your husband sign this? And I said, why does my husband have to sign my form? He needs to give you permission to work. Mm -hmm. Alice, can you come sign my form? Why? Mm -hmm. Because I need your permission. What's in it for me? <laughs> <laughs> On my first day, uh, my boss, Saudi man, tells me to go uh, on an orientation, go from one department to the other, get the lay of the land. So I go to the finance office to meet the head of the finance department. And when I walk into the office, it's a woman, a Saudi woman with a veil covering her face. All I can see is her eyes, and she sits me down and she says, Satiha, what is the objective of your meeting? Well, but I, I, I have an objective, uh, and I crack a joke. Now I don't know if she's smiling or strong. Uh, All I see is a veil of her. Let's see, I'm walking in the hallway. And there's a woman coming right in front of me. And when she crosses me, she has a veil on. She says, Hi, Sabiha. And I say, Hi. Yesterday, I said, You have a veil on your face. Say that. But they figured it out. They've gotten used to figuring out who's who, even if it's this thing or a veil of us. Actually, what struck me. Was the woman power in the hospital? It's not 
what I saw. Women were department heads, they were head of IT, they were head of clinical departments, they were head of finance, they were war clerks, all the way through the various levels, they were doing research. It's not what I thought. And then you would think that with so many expat nurses from the United States and Canada in that hospital, that the Saudi men may think that they are more accessible. Never a major moment. I was the de facto HR person of our division. Nothing ever hit my screen. Nothing ever hit my door. It wasn't what I thought. There is reverse discrimination. In the shopping mall, after 8 p.m., which is prime time, they are not similar. That's when everybody descends on the shopping mall. A man, a single man, cannot enter the shopping mall unless he is accompanied by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> a mother, a sister, his mother and sister. Why? Because they want to make sure that they don't harass the woman. Airlines. When you're boarding, you like over here, we have first class first and the veterans first and, you know, priority and everybody's getting anxious. Ladies first in Saudi Arabia. So if you want to vote first, get attached to a woman. <laughs> it wasn't what I thought. The culture shock I had over there was not what I was imagining, like women, oppression, and all of that. It was... It was so much more than that. One thing was the language. Well, everybody there spoke English. Everything was in English. But Arabic language has its quirks. So I'll read a bit from the book. I knew even before coming to Saudi that the Arabic alphabet does not have the equivalent of the letter P. Over time, I learned that it also doesn't have the letter B. Nor does it have the ch sound, as in change or cleanup. So I'm chatting with my colleague, you know, a Lebanese woman, and she says to me, would you like to share a meeting? And I say, which meeting? She says, quality indicators. Would you like to share it? And I said, share what? And we're going back and forth, back and forth, and then, oh, you want me to share the meeting? <laughs> yes, that's what I said. Share. At another time, I was in a meeting with a group of clinicians and the radiologist was presenting an issue, and he said, you see, every time I put the film in the viewer, and he went on to make his point. Excuse me, I leaned forward, cupping my hands behind my ear. Could you please repeat that? He turned towards me. When I put the film in the viewer, I'm sorry. Where do you put the film? In the viewer. He raised his hands up to his eye level and made a square to skew the film. I should have kept my mouth shut instead of explaining, oh, you mean the viewer. Now I've embarrassed him. Yes, the viewer, he said, <laughs> not with missing the people. <laughs> then there was another culture shock. The work week, Saturday through Wednesday. Sunday was a working day. Thursday, Friday was the weekend. And when somebody would say to me, see you tomorrow, you know, I say, see you tomorrow at the office. No, you won't. It's Thursday. Oh, yeah, right. right. <laughs> so think about how business is done between USA and Saudi Arabia. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays are the only days you can communicate. And even Wednesday, you're in a it's Tangled Friday mode. <laughs> then there is the British system versus the metric system. I go shopping and I ask for a pound of turkey breast. Ma'am, how many kilos? Oh dear. Is it 2.2 kilos to a pound or 2.2 pounds to a kilo? I may end up with twice as much. My recipes were in ounces and pounds, and now I have to try and convert the ingredients which are in bran and litter, and my carrot cake comes out rock solid, floating in oil. <laughs> then there's the Fahrenheit height versus the centigrade. So 40 degrees over here means bundle up and stay in sun. 40 degrees in Saudi Arabia means unbundle and stay in sun. <laughs> then there is the order of the date. When I was in Pakistan, it used to be day to date, month, month, year, year. I come to the United States and now it's month, month, day to year, year. I go to Saudi Arabia and this back to 
date, date, month, month, year, year. I make an appointment with someone for July 6th. He shows up on June 7th. 7th, 6th versus 6th, 7th. Then there is the military time versus the standard time. My calendar appointment, see you at 1400 hours. Um, yeah, 2 p.m., okay. Then it's Gregorian year versus the Hitra year. Hitra is the Islamic calendar. So the year 2001 is the year 1422. And so on the calendar, you have the particular date, and then when you get the bottom, you have the corresponding proposal date. Here's what happened to me. Just when I thought I had it figured out, I was at the travel agent making vacation plans for November, and he placed a calendar in front of me and asked me to identify the Hitler date. Now, if I am leaving from New York on Wednesday, November 7th, try figuring this out. I have to put my leave in Hitra, inform my family of my arrival date in Gregorian, take a flight in Hitra at the military time of 10, 20 hours, and land in New York on the Gregorian date in non-military time. <laughs> so with a 16-hour flight going west, minus the 8-hour time difference, with no daylight saving time in effect, figure this out please. <laughs> on what date and what time do I arrive in New York? <laughs> I have to let my children know when to receive us. And ask the airline. They always make mistakes. <laughs> the last time I relied on the airline's itinerary, we arrived in Malaysia a day earlier. Imagine my surprise when the hotel in Kuala Lumpur informed us that we did not have reservations for that day. But we do. Here's my confirmation receipt. It says Friday, I said. Ma'am, today is Thursday. Five months into our stay, 9-11 happened. What was that like for me? Personally, professionally, and at a larger society level. My husband and I were in a cab, going to Mecca for the pilgrimage, when something crackled on the cab driver's radio. What's that? What? What was this? What did I just feel? We couldn't put our heads around it. We couldn't wrap our heads around it. It was incomprehensible. As soon as I checked into the hotel, I was running up to my room, turned on the uh, TV, and the news was just shutting, uh, shutting down, and the towers were falling. I rushed downstairs. My son worked at the hotel, lived close worked close to the World Trade Center and very often has morning meetings. I need to make a phone call. I want to make sure my son's okay. Man, we don't have long distance calls. You have to go to a call center. My father stopped. He said, you are at the house of God. You couldn't be at a better place at a worse time. Go and pray for the son's sake. You can make the call later on. Thankfully, I listened to him. I walked around the car park, praying, praying. He said, my son be okay. My son be okay. After that, I went to the call center. He was shutting it down. I pleaded with him. He let me make a call. All cell lines had been shut down. Didn't get through. I then called my sister-in-law on her landline, who lived in Long Island, who picked up on the first ring and said, you can't get through. <laughs> Coming back to work, the Saudis just wrapped their arms around us. They comforted us, they counseled us. I had to get counseling, professional counseling. They gave us all kinds of freedom, cancel your contract, <clears throat> leave if you want to, no penalties, nothing. And at the larger society level, it's not what we could do. It wasn't like that. No one was in love. No one was saying. People got angry that Osama bin Laden had done that by putting a Saudi face to the uh, to the act. He could have gotten his people from anywhere. And then another five months later, I copied performed the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. In fact, the Hajj was recently performed in Mecca just two weeks ago. It is a place where no Muslim can go. I spend much real estate of my book talking about the hut because anyone who has seen a documentary only gets a bird's eye view. 
and I will describe to you what it is like to be inside with our tent, in our tent, listening to our conversation up close and personal. See how it is like to move from station to station as we honor Abraham, the patriarch, and we walk in his footsteps. You will see the crust of the crowd, the exhaustion, the stumbling, our mishaps, the spiritual high, and be in awe of the gathering of the divine. And then I was there when the Father died in our hospital. It was nothing like the pageantry of Queen Elizabeth's death. When you think of how ostentatious and luxurious this lifetime is, it lasts only during their lifetime when they're dead. I have a chapter devoted to the anti and I'll close by talking about the paradox of the way. Before we feel so sorry for Saudi women, know that they don't feel sorry for themselves. They feel pride in their values. From our perspective, we are outraged at what we see, a woman oppressed. We don't see it that way. And by they, I mean the women. So who are we to judge? I was at a class where they were giving instructions on the Hajj, and they said, you cannot conceal your faces while you're performing the Hajj, and the women throw out protest, raising their voices. Uh, you can't tell us not to cover up, not to bail us. I was, I was shocked. Then there is a sad side to it. I noticed a colleague of mine, a man, in a sad state, and I asked him, what's the matter? And he said, my brother is dying. I said, why don't you go see him? And he explained to me that it's because his sister-in-law is with his brother, his sister-in-law wears the veil, and he feels that his presence will be an imposition on us. I came to my office and cried. Tears of compassion for my father, his sacrifice, and tears of frustration at the veil that separates brother from dying brother. Two days later, when I watched him saw that the death of his brother, I left over the precious moment he gave up to respect the boundaries of the baby. And with that, I pray. Thank you, Sadeh Han. Certainly not what I'm talking about. Uh, several instances about Saudi Arabia. We have a few minutes for a few questions for either of the authors before I get to find out. That, do we have any questions either for Pam or Sydney? Is that fair? I think that's his tell. We can't quite hear. Why don't you actually come up? If we don't have a mobile microphone for you. I really am enjoying it very much. Okay. One question I have as uh, I've been reading this fascinating book. My husband, my late husband, who was an engineer working at Grumman Aerospace, was invited, as were his teammates, uh, as designer of the F-14, uh, I guess, fighter jet, to go to Saudi Arabia and at another time to Iran. But I wondered, as a Jewish American, how that would play out, um, understanding that as a Muslim um, and a Pakistani from the very close to Saudi Arabia, that might well have been a very different experience for me. So I elected not to go and stay in New York, but my fellow um, uh, travelers uh, who were almost not, no, none of them were Jewish, but they were Catholic and Protestants, um, actually uh, had to stay on campus, on a Roman campus, uh, almost the entire time. So it was a very different experience than what we're reading about, which is adding to my understanding of what is possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
thank you for your uh, that question and thank you for your interest in reading the book. When I was there, uh, anti-Jewish sentiment was pervasive, and most of the expats from the West who were there were non-Jewish. Um, now that has changed. Now we see rabbis going there and trying to establish, you know, Jewish cultural centers. Uh, they're also thinking about establishing a place of worship that, that may take some time to develop. But things change very rapidly when MD, MDS took over. So now there is a Jewish presence growing in Saudi Arabia, which was not at the time when I was there from 2001 to 2007. And so Yes, but you're, but you're seeing in the news in the last year of protests by women in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, some things have changed. Can you assess how much they changed and what is happening now? So the question is about uh, recent protests in Saudi Arabia. I thought it yeah, has a sense of how things have changed. I have been in touch with my Saudi colleagues there as well as the Saudi friends that I had. And what they tell me is MBS, yes, he made changes. He gave women the uh, permission to uh, drive. They no longer are required to wear the black cloak. They no longer are required to wear their faces and they have the freedom to travel. However, tradition trumps. Tradition overrides royal edicts. So by royal edicts, you can say, yes, you can drive, but the only women who are driving are those women who have the explicit and implicit permission of their husband or their mentor. And the same is true for the cloak. You walk the uh, mall in Riyadh, and most of the women are wearing the kabaya because that is in keeping with their family tradition, even though they are not required to. Many people who are in favor of the changes and the openness and the freedom that women are, are getting applaud it, but then there are those who say it's corrupt society. Those in favor say it's a good idea that women are driving because it gives them mobility or the other good reasons. Others say that it puts them in harm's way. Some support the freedom that women now have to work and they are working in public places across the board. There are others who say that it impedes their chances of finding a husband and their children are neglected. Some people are happy with the changes. Some people feel that the pendulum has swung too far. So I, I would say that our knowledge of Saudis is reduced to sound bites and headlines, and we are prone to a mistaken sense of homogeneity. But if you have seen one Saudi, you have seen one Saudi. They are as diverse uh, as, as we are. Thank you for the question. We might have to sneak in one more question. Okay, I had it too, but I just, uh, um, my question is you mentioned the gulf of differences in between the rural area and the city. Now, yes or no, it's in the interest of time. Is the law the same in the rural area? As in the city, uh, what would you attribute that and that difference? That well, if I understand the question, it's whether the law is the same in the city and the desert, the country areas or not. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is very interesting. The laws have not been written. <laughs> okay, so it was left up to the morality police to police the. Uh, Police the women. And that is what made it extremely difficult to know am I doing the right thing or am I doing the wrong thing? Because uh, the morality police had a lot of power. They had the power to have you arrested. They were always accompanied by a cop. And if you didn't do what they said, like if they said, cover your hair, you better cover your hair or you will end up in jail. But there was no law on the books. I went looking into the bookstore of like, what's the law? What am I supposed to do? That was the hard part. Nothing was written. So in the rural areas, because nothing was written, they did whatever was acceptable there. And in the, in the urban areas, they have to afford the standards. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I have a few books, but they are available in the bookstore as well. 